you know, it wasn't easy. Um, you know, many times we would, you know, not have any food and we had to, you know, go to the food bank every week. We were waiting for our food bank delivery. Wow. Um, just so we could eat, you know, or when, you know, mum was getting paid the benefit, we'd be waiting up to midnight. So we'd go into the bank account. Whoa, for real. So we could go to the shop and wow. get something from a petrol station or something, you know, so we could have some food and, and then, you know, we would be moving from house to house because we went behind in the rent and yeah. you get kicked out and you just didn't know where you were going to next. So it affected a lot of things, you know, even with school and stuff. You know, mm. many times I would miss school for months on end because Whoa. we didn't have a house. So I couldn't go to school. Like, we'd have to Whoa. go to different places, man. Like, it was, it was tough living. Um, I was partying all the time. And so whenever it's partying, people are spending heaps on alcohol. I was smoking weed. We were spending money on that. When you smoke weed, you get the munchies. So then we're (laughs) spending money on the munchies. And (laughs) if there's anyone who's broke in the group, you have to shout them too. Like heaps of money went out like that, you know? And I'm thinking like my wife, when she was my girlfriend then, it would be easy that someone gets paid and they could spend $500 in one night. Seriously. On alcohol. I'm not kidding. That's crazy. All right, bro. So uh, I suppose since you're quite the economist, you got a lot to say today. (laughs) So the topic is obviously cost of living. Of all the topics, you know, we've done crime, but I think this one seems to be at the tip of people's tongues. You know, it's part of the biggest debates i think within the campaigns for elections because i think at the end of the day people are really mostly concerned about you know how much money is in their pockets how much they have to feed their families that's really bottom line for most people you know i think it probably affects people more than ram raids over in hamilton or or wherever to be honest you know people are really more concerned about their wallets Mm. so it's a relevant matter and so I, i was thinking you know um from the talks we've listened to with the government people debating here and there, it appears that there is no consensus about a solution to the cost of living crisis uh, right across parties, uh, you know. So it's obviously not as simple a solution as it might appear to be. So anyway, we've decided to tackle it because we <laughs> are clearly not economists, but, you know, we just feel that there's, there's things within the reach of people that can make a difference, um, yeah, within our realm. So, yeah, I suppose, you know, I don't know whether, since you're white and uh, straight. I'm privileged, man. And privileged. <laughs> I don't know if you even know what poverty is, bro. What's never, your story? I've never heard of it, man. <laughs> yeah, you would be the one in poverty, right? And I, I should be having my mansion or something like that. Went to private school, maybe. And your so. inheritance from your forefathers that they got. <laughs> Yeah, I guess, um, like you said, you know, the everyone's interested in what the parties are going to do to solve this problem uh, for the crisis that we're facing at the moment with the cost of living. And like you said, everyone's saying different things, but no one gives a straight up answer. You know, there's mm. no real consensus on this is what we're going to do. It's a lot of words, you mm. know, to sound good, but no, no real answers. And people are worried, you know, petrol is out the out of the roof, mm. food's gone up, you know, housing, all this stuff. So what are people going to do? And mm. Yeah, I guess for, you know, myself, I've, I know what it's like to live in poverty. Um, you know, growing up as a kid when my parents split up, you know, I lived with my mom and we used to move around a lot of different places, you know, we were sort of gypsies, you know, it felt like at a time because we'd move from one city to another city Mm. or to a town and living with different family members. And, you know, it wasn't easy. Um, you know, many times we would, you know, not have any food and we had to, you know, go to the food bank every week. We were waiting for our food bank delivery. Wow. Um, just so we could eat, you know, or when, you know, mum was getting paid the benefit, we'd be waiting up to midnight. So we'd go into the bank account. Whoa, for real. So we could go to the shop and wow. get something from a petrol station or something, you know, so we could have some food. And, and then, you know, we would be moving from house to house cause we went behind in the rent and yeah. you get kicked out and you just didn't know where you were going to next. So it affected a lot of things, you know, even with school and stuff, you know, mm. many times I would miss school for months on end because Whoa. we didn't have a house. So I couldn't go to school. Like we'd have to Whoa. go to different places, man. Like Far it was, it was tough living. Um, and yeah, so I know, I know what it's like to live in poverty and, you know, a lot of times we'd be living in the car for, a, for example, for weeks on end. Um, 
I remember, you know, one time actually my my mum was getting like swollen ankles and stuff because we were sitting upright for too long without being in bed. Whoa. So we had to, you know, try and make shift to get her legs raised and all this stuff. But at one time we were sleeping at a park, you know, we'd, we'd go to parks or beaches so we could find some quiet spots and, you know. Bro, you would never imagine this could happen in New Zealand. Exactly right. I mean, what? we do have a welfare system, but, um, you know, I guess not everyone always makes the best decisions, you know, in life. And, it's easy to get in debt because you're trying to get more to provide. Mm. Um, because, you know, I wasn't getting any uh, help from my father. So it was all on mum to take wow. care of me and my brother. So, But I remember, yeah, one time we were in a park and we woke up and, you know, there was a coffee guy there who was who had set up there early in the morning. And, you know, he was laughing at us as we were sitting in our car, like waking up in the morning. And, you know, it's just quite shocking. And what? I guess, you know, as a society today, you know, people are definitely struggling with different things. But... There's real people who are dealing dealing with real, real issues of, mm. of poverty and, and debt and and um, those are the a lot of the things that we don't see. Bro, what what you're saying, like I thought I knew, <laughs> but this is like, whoa, you know, in New Zealand, um, and I suppose that's the challenge with just looking at stats, you know, numbers on a paper or headlines on a newspaper article. They're not on the ground, mm. you know, in people's mm. homes, in their hearts, really experiencing what they're going through. It's just a broad perspective. You know, it's not like everyone is being asked the question, how are you doing? They just calculate roughly, you know, and give numbers. And, and mm. it's never really as personal as what I'm hearing from you, you know. Yeah, like you said, you know, the, the government, uh, we were expecting the government to change our families and change, you know, our situations and stuff like that. But like you said, no one's on the ground floor with yeah. you, like right there actually yeah. solving any of your issues. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, everyone, people who are in those predicaments at the moment, you know, are worried about, you know, what are we going to do with mm. all these prices going up and people are in debt and then other people who are just seeing this happening and it's getting tight on their wallets, you know. What's the answer, man? Bro, this is so deep. Because, you know, I thought I had a story from Zimbabwe, you know, but it's like, whoa, this is a New Zealand story. Because, you know, I think back growing up, um, you know, I moved in with my dad when I was six. And then when I turned seven, he died, you know. And so my dad was a wealthy man, but because he was a businessman, he had a lot of debt, you know. So then obviously a lot of my siblings, because imagine you're, you're 10 kids plus two grandchildren living in a home with no mums, just one dad, and then he's controlling everything, paying all the bills, supporting everybody's school fees, everything, and then just like that, he's gone. Mm. And then now it's like the oldest siblings are the parents, but they're not even ready to be parents. So, so in terms of the focus and even ability to manage business, manage debt, manage a family, meet the needs of children, it was like, whoa, you know? And so slowly, businesses got shut. Um, you know, we couldn't pay power. Uh, you know, we had satellite dish. It was now just an ornament. The <laughs> pool was green gunge. That's what we swam in. You know, we had an electric gate. It was now a push gate. You know, and so it was just an outward shell for the people outside. We got, it got so bad that we were breaking down our bunk beds to make fire serious you know and, and cooking on the in the fireplace wow. with stove but with no power you can't afford power yeah. so that's what you're doing and you know when you were sharing about wait waiting up till late you know i remember waiting up uh for my second oldest brother you know everyone no one had eaten and he we waited up till midnight for him to bring hot chips home you know and everyone was like yay <laughs> dinner you know um wow yeah but, you know, I, I was thinking, oh, that's a third world narrative, you mm, know, mm. and certainly not for no white, white guy, <laughs> y you know. Um, yeah, but I, I suppose, you know, that's the thing with statistics, you know, and generalization that you don't know the story of anyone until you talk to them, mm. you know, and it's like, actually, uh, I've been there. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's an interesting thing, you know, to think about. So. so yeah, what brings people to those situations? In some cases, it's just uncontrollable circumstances. Like it's beyond your control. I mean, for you, what can you do? It's beyond your control. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter what government was going to be in power at the time. You know, the situation with your family, how people relate to each other impacted your circumstances. And for us, 
we had, yeah, government had a part to play, but the government didn't kill my dad. Yeah. You know, yeah. that was something that just happened. And mm. so it's beyond the government's control to sort that out, you know. Yeah. 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 So, so you know, I think in New Zealand, um, like, who do you see are the most vulnerable? You know, what are, who are the people doing it the most tough? Um, yeah, I think, like, definitely children, you know, for sure. Yeah. Like, I think about, uh, you know, our experiences. We were kids, so we were in the, you know, our parents were providing for us yeah. or whoever was taking care of us, so we had to rely on them mm. to be able to live. Um, so, yeah, it's hard because, if, you know, if your parents are making bad decisions or, you know, they're wasting the money or anything like that, the kids really just have to put up with whatever the consequences oh, are yeah. of that. So you definitely see children are in vulnerable, vulnerable positions um, and, you know, older people, people as well. Yeah. Um, people on pensions, you know, they're not working anymore or they're getting a little bit, but they still get something from the government, which, which is, is a, which is good. You know, it's a real blessing um, mm. considering some countries don't get that at all. Nothing at all. So, yeah, but uh, it definitely can be tough for them, especially mm. with, you know, the increase of prices at the moment um, and people are worried about that. And, um, yeah, I think that those are the main, well, from my perspective, those yeah. are the two main categories. I don't know what you think. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I would add to that, you know, obviously, uh, I did a little stint working at New World, you know, and got to just mingle with people who were in different circumstances. And I suppose foreigners can often be in a bit of a challenging mm. situation just because of the, you know, you're only allowed like 20 hours something like that depending on your visa but yeah. some are, have a limited visa especially foreign students that don't have rich families you know so they come over here they're trying to make a bit of living so they have to start as students because that's their reason to come mm -hmm. and so then you have a, a limitation on how much work you can get and then you're studying you know and so your entitlements even in just an ordinary job you can only be a casual worker so what you get uh, in terms of sick leave and all of that is so much less than mm. someone who's here. So it's tough. It's really tough and often on minimum wage, you know, the uh, vast majority of them. So, and I think from the articles we were reading and listening to, a lot of students um, are doing it tough anyway, mm. you know. So, so then for those who are foreigners, they pay more fees to study, you know, and they probably left families back home. They've got to try and support them. It's a, it's a real difficult situation to be in, you know. So I think those are... Those are doing it tough. Um, yeah, maybe people who are sick, disabled. Mm. Uh, I'm not really sure what the, um, you know, uh, entitlements for people who are disabled or sick are, but um, it's a huge cost. Mm. Yeah, in terms of doctors' visits and yeah. all the expenses involved with that, and the inability to do anything about it. You know, mm. to, to provide for your family when you've got, say, cancer or whatever other critical illness, you're in a very vulnerable situation. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. You know, what's the solution to to help these vulnerable people, you know? Because, well, what do you think about people who aren't in those categories? Then? Yeah. Let's so, say just the normal working class. Yeah, yeah. So, class people. I suppose, you know, I, I think th there's, uh, there's an article here. It's from News Hub that says, under 25s fearing the worst from cost of living crisis, new data shows. And so, you know, I, I think I am sympathetic. I am compassionate to those who are struggling. Uh, I go back to, to my situation when I first came to New Zealand, and I suppose, you know, I, I'd never used the Internet before. This is the start. It might be a long story. <laughs> How old are you, man? Thank you for <laughs> short, short. I'd never used the Internet before. So I come here, and, you know, I remember first thing was I had no job. I got... It, on uh, Grey North Road, I got a speeding ticket going both ways. So I didn't know about the speed camera. So boom, <laughs> that way, this way. So I had a speeding ticket. And then, you know, you're, uh, you're online. You're trying to make it in the world, you know, and you're like uh, trying to do homework. And then bing, 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 you've won a million dollars. I'm like, yo! <laughs> I had the Did jackpot for right? that. <laughs> time after time, right? And then they'd be like, put your email. It's like 20 steps later. And it's like, yeah. ah. I got scammed. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you're, you're in a desperate situation, so you do fall for that. Mm -hmm. So then what happened to me when I was at uni, uh, you, I got offered uh, overdraft where I was like, is my shot out of poverty. Cha -ching. <laughs> you're very naive. You know, you're not even thinking far ahead. You're thinking, man, I could do with an extra yeah. $1,000. Yeah. Um, 
a five hundred dollar credit card, and you know that coupled with uh, my own personal bad decisions as well, as well as those ones. You know, I remember I got a, a flip phone, double camera, Ooh. bro, double camera flip phone bro. from Vodafone. It was like two hundred and something dollars, you know, but I didn't have the money anyway. Yeah. It was like 40 bucks a month repayments. But what happened was they don't cap the 40 bucks. So you're using it like there's no tomorrow, thinking I'm going to get a $40 bill. Nick Minute, the bill's 250 <laughs> It's like, what? You a told month. me it's 40 Ooh. bucks a month. Anyway, it compounded because now, you know, uh, you don't pay. And then they cut off your line. And then it's just like gaining interest. Yeah, yeah. And I can't afford to pay it off. And it was just like, I'm stuck. And I was like, look, at least let me use it if you're going to keep charging me. But I remember that was the biggest uh, step towards me getting into terrible financial crisis. Um, and I didn't know how to get out of it because I, I you know, I, I, I wasn't good at budgeting my own money, wasn't good at saving. I really didn't know how to solve the mess, you mm. know. Um, plus student budget, bro, I was, I was in a bit of a pickle. And I suppose I can't blame anyone for that, you know, even though there was some, I, I felt like, you know, the big companies, if, you, if they sell a student, so say 40 bucks at the end of the month, and then you give me a 250 bill, like, bro, that's a little bit of dishonesty yeah. in dealing there, you know, and, and I think a lot of people fall into those traps, you know, where you're offered these promises by people, whether it's loan sharks or whatever, and you think, oh, yeah, and then it comes back to bite you. Yeah, I think that's what most people are struggling with, you know, in society today. And everyone's always been in debt, you know. You know, if you look across the board, a lot of people are in debt to something. Mm. Um, but obviously with the price of, you know, food and petrol and housing all going up, then it just makes it a little compounds bit it. Mm. worse, you know, and compounds it all. Um, but yeah, I, you know, we can't blame anyone for, you know, our debt in a sense, you know. Yeah. It's sort of like a vicious cycle yeah, that goes around cycle. and around. but. You know, we get into debt, you know, we, we want a car or, you know, we want a house or we want, you know, this and that. So, you know, we get a loan for it, we do that. And then, you know, we're paying back these interest rates, whatever yeah. it is, and they start skyrocketing. And then with everything going up, Which it just happening it makes it worse. And that's really why everyone's complaining at the moment. Yeah, It's not because, yeah, things are definitely going up in price, yeah. but it's because, you know, a lot of people do have these debts. Mm. And they're trying to service those as well as when everything else is going up. It just makes your money mm. a lot thinner, you know, yeah. across the board. Totally. Yeah. And I was thinking that, you know, there's, there's the two sides to it, you know, in the vicious cycle. So on the government side, you know, I think that when corporations are baiting people into debt like that, you know, because they're constantly luring people yeah. in. Everywhere you look. Everywhere at. you look, you know. So then, okay, you know, there, there should be some just practice there where... Um, I remember listening to the radio and they were saying, you know, like people struggle to pay their power. So then they get cut off, but then they get charged reconnection fees, which yeah. the company's got enough profits anyway. Yeah, yeah. So now you're charging me $200 reconnection fees. I'm already in debt. It's like, come on. Just make it worse. It makes man. it worse. And yeah. it only affects the most vulnerable, yeah. you know. And I think that on the government side, you know, where there is sort of um, uh, organized co Corporate corruption on mm. that level, mm. the government can step in and say, actually, this is not acceptable, yeah. you know, um, because I'm thinking, you know, if, if here's one story to add to this corporate corruption, this is not so corporate, but remember the Filipino family we met, mm -hmm. you know, they were living in a house and they were renting one room. So this family is renting one room. And they're being charged $500 a week for one room. And the person who owns the house rents out every room separately. $500 for one room. Yeah, like, that's, that's I was criminal, like, come man. That is on, criminal. seriously. Yeah, you know? yeah. And so a lot of people, because they prey on the vulnerable and you don't have any other option, it's like you're stuck. You know? Because these guys, like, what are you going to do? Who are you going to complain to? You know? um, yeah, it's um, because... When we were young, you know, mum didn't have much money, so to get a car or something like that, you'd always, because she had bad credit anyway from doing things in the, to, which is the reality, to yeah. trying to support us, you know, like 
But it's these loan shark companies that would be like, we can give you a card, bad credit, no, no credit. credit. <laughs> I know. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. But the interest rate is so much higher Bro. than anywhere else. So people get sucked in there because that's our only, their only option, you know. Totally. So they get that and they just get into more debt. Totally. And, you know, we wouldn't even pay the cars back totally. half the time because yeah. we couldn't afford it. Yeah. So then we would lose the car, but you'd still be having, having to, to pay it off. Pay, that's what happened with the phone, you know. Exactly the same thing. It's tragic. And like you said, you know, the government should, could maybe, you know, look at stepping in with these sort of, totally. should be a fair rate across the board. Totally. You know, and Especially all these... for the vulnerable. Because yeah. those are the ones who are going to borrow. <laughs> exactly. Those desperate scenario and loans. And these companies you know? purposely target those people they because they they want them because that's the only way they're going to make money. That's where they yeah, make, they make the money <laughs> off the poor people, you know. It's, ah, it's just, it is tragic. Man. Tragic. Yeah. That's sad. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, on the government side, there's no question that, that has to be cracked down on, you know. And um, yeah, you know, be, being able to, um, to make some tough policies on people who do prey on the vulnerable like that, I think is something that the government can do on their side. Um, yeah, I was thinking also, I'd written something down uh, because they were talking about supermarkets, mm -hmm. you know, that they make billions of dollars in profit. And, you know, I don't quite understand the whole story behind it, but surely if they're making billions of dollars in profit, m meaning, you know, other supermarket owners in other countries don't earn that much. So maybe the profit threshold is so huge that they could bring prices down. Yeah. You know, they could yeah. and, and do it better for, for people who are poor. Uh, but one other thing I've thought about uh, supermarkets is like how much wastage, you know, that they, of stuff they just throw in the bin that they could just like half price it, quarter price it and help those who need it the most rather than let it, like you can see it, it's going to go bad. Just, you know, discount it heavily, but it will meet the real need. It might not balance the books or whatever, you know, but they can claim losses at the end of the tax year. But like let people have the food rather than trash it because that's all the crop that was grown that year that's the food that's available and if you let it go to waste so you can just claim tax back like someone could have eaten that food you know but that's reality um, man like that's the reality of the world that we really live in you know the way that it's gone like people would rather get rid of food wrong than give it to people who really need it you know or even discount it at a price to people who could get it know, at least, could yeah. afford it something to help them out, but they would rather just bin it all, you know, and it's like, I, I saw those articles, you know, we said the, the supermarkets during COVID and all those sort of things, you know, were making billions. Bro. And, and everyone else was struggling, you know, and it's like, it just seems like a real injustice. It does. Um, so I definitely see how the government could put some things in to bring down, you know, totally. the costs of food. Totally. Um, you mm -hmm. know, they're talking about trying to bring GS, GST off certain foods and all those sort of things. So. Those could definitely be practical steps to yeah, help. help people, yeah. Because, yeah. you know, I'm thinking, you mentioned COVID. There's certain things that the government can't control. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not a, uh, an economist, so I don't know how they could have managed better. Yeah. But across the board, people were crying out for lockdowns. And so it was something that happened. There was fear. No one really knew what to do. Okay, so there's mandates and lockdowns. So I can't criticize the government to say you should have opened up the borders because if yeah. you're afraid of people dying, and that's what the experts are saying, I would do the same, yeah, yeah. you know. But, you know, that's something that took place out of anyone's control. Like no one was predicting that, okay, there's going to come this uh, disease that's going to cause the whole world to be shut down for extended periods of time. And the ripple effect of that is really not the government's fault. Like, it's uncontrollable. And then you think of natural disasters. Auckland had floods. Mm. Like, what do you do about that, you know? So, so there's, in this instance, issues that can't really be controlled on the government side, you know? They're kind of just trying to recoup uh, from all of that um, unforeseen damage, you know? Um, yeah. So, um, you've been a teen. This one says under 25s obviously. So, so at some stage you were taking care of your own money. You were no longer, you know, a dependent, you know, how did you go with, with, you know, your own, uh, financial situation when you became independent? Yeah, I think for me, um, just seeing how, you know, my mother sort of had to deal with her finances and the struggles that we went through, it was a big thing for me to make sure I, 
was you know keeping my finances under control and I wasn't trying to get into debt because I didn't want to get into the same patterns cycle. in the cycle you know and then yeah. being in those same positions it was you know an eye opener and it sort of scared me off wanting to go there so you know I was actually pretty I would say relatively good with what you know the money that I was getting you know I would try and save and I wouldn't try and spend without out of without a side of my means you know mm. because I didn't really want to get into those positions so mm. Yeah, I know a lot of people though, you know, when you haven't had anything and then you start getting some, you sort of just spend it all, you know. <laughs> but for me, it was a little bit different. Yeah. Um, and I'm still like that today, you know. Um, yeah. Even though my partner says, you know, you're a bit of a Scrooge yeah, sometimes. Tight. <laughs> you're too tight. <laughs> you know, it's an interesting point you bring up, you know, because, you know, while it's easy to look at the government as the, the great fixer of all these situations, While it's easy to look at the government, you know, as the great fixer of all these situations, you know, what you're saying, I think, is something that that was like the elephant in the room in my youth days, you know, that the obvious elephant in the room was I was bad at saving. Um, I was partying all the time. And so whenever it's partying, people are spending heaps on alcohol. Yeah, yeah. I was smoking weed. We were spending money on that. When you smoke weed, you get the munchies. So then we're <laughs> spending go money food, on man. the munchies. And <laughs> if there's anyone who's broke in the group, you have to shout them yeah, too. Yeah. Like heaps of money went out like that. you know. And I'm thinking like my wife, when she was my girlfriend then, it would be easy that someone gets paid and they could spend $500 in one night. <sighs> Seriously. On alcohol. I'm yeah, not kidding. That's crazy. Uh, and I'm thinking, you know, like I was a sprinter. I got sponsorship money. You know, I would get checks of money. I was, my coach took me in. So, you know, I was paying no rent, doing no washing, no cooking. My protein shakes were sponsored. Like all of that was taken care of. So all I had to do was run. Mm. And I had all these benefits. You know, I had added a sponsorship, chiropractor sponsorship. So, so I had lots of incomings. I was still working part-time uni getting your student allowance so lots of incoming but i didn't save a thing like nothing <laughs> i could have saved thousands of dollars but yeah. i didn't i wasted it on on fun and pleasure and it's like where is all that now and you know as sad as it is to see people in in trouble i i look back on my own life and i think wow you know how much of this was self-inflicted mm. because of my own carelessness you know like I could have easily not spent on alcohol if times were tough, you know? I mean, it's it's so funny. I had an uncle, bro, he would rather spend his $20 on a tinny to get high than on toothpaste or food. I'm serious. <laughs> I'm serious. Priorities, man. <laughs> Priorities. And, you know, after, like for me, the reason I actually then stopped weed and all of that was because, you know, I would, I would watch this unfolding yeah. and it started to break my heart to think, yeah. wow, like, have we stooped this low that weed is our be all and end all? And it's like, wow, we won't even buy toothpaste. Wow. You know, he would talk like this. <laughs> and I, I would go and take him food, you yeah, know? And then yeah. it, it started dawning on me. It's like, bro, what are you doing with your life? Meaning me, I'm thinking, what am I doing with my life? You know, um, where am I headed? You know, I'm just kind of living day by day, not even thinking about tomorrow, mm -hmm. you know, not even thinking, mm -hmm. okay, like, what am I trying to achieve in life? You know, what are my goals? Because day to day, you're just like wherever the wind blows. Bro, let's go do this. Off you go. Let's go do this. Off you go. And you cannot expect to balance your books living like yeah. that. You know, and, and this goes for not just me. Like almost all of us of my crew around that time lived like that. You know, just waiting for the next thing. And uh, so debt was a thing. You know, people were in debt for phones, people were in debt for cars, uh, debt for clothes. Like everyone was always trying to keep up with the latest fashions, living beyond our means. And no one wanted to go to work. Like that's another <laughs> thing. When you get stoned. <laughs> and sure, there must be some working stoners out there. But a lot of the stoners I was around didn't, didn't want to go to work. Yeah. You know, would cancel work for a mission. Um... And I think that that's an area that that everyone really needs to think about, you know, about personal responsibility and, and living beyond your means, like you're saying, you know, everyone wants the flashest TV, um, 
Netflix, internet, flash phone, and, and where do we get all that from? Are we saving to buy it or is it just all on credit? It's all on credit, man. <laughs> like, like you said, because we all desire what someone else has, you know. Yeah. It's like, oh, I, want, I want what my mate's got or see someone on social media and you're like, I want that pair of clothing, I want that car, I want that lifestyle. So you just tick it up, you know, tick it up, tick it up on credit. Because it doesn't hurt in the yeah, moment. Yeah, it doesn't hurt you in the moment, it. you know. And then when you have to repay it, and then prices are going up here, and you're having to repay that, it just all compiles. It does. And then you go to the government, and you're like, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. But really, you know, we get ourselves in those positions because we're trying to live a different lifestyle. Sadly. We want different things, sadly. Yeah. And it's like the government can't fix that. Yeah. You know? We're going, we've been going through a recession, you know, we went through COVID, yeah. all of these things, you know, money was given out to people who needed it, businesses, people weren't working. So those, oh. where was that money coming from? I know. You know, it had to come from somewhere. So now they have to try and recuperate that yeah. because, you know, the, the, the country went into debt getting that money to pay people. Yeah. So it's like, you have to take all of these things into account. factor mm -hmm. and account and realize, you know, this is the reason that the country is going through tough times like this. We Absolutely. can't really just look at the government and be like, hey, you need to fix Absolutely. all of these problems, you know, it's like... <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, what What can we do? You know, there is practical steps and solutions that we can do, I think, as individuals yeah. to try and alleviate some sort of the pain yeah. and stress. Yeah. But, um, yeah, man, what is it? Yeah. Well, you know, I'm just thinking that the first one, uh, like, for me, uh, when, I, when I started a little family, you know, um, we were poor. We were poor, um, but I suppose it was at the time of my conversion to Christianity, you know, so I gave up alcohol mm -hmm. without a blink because I had a baby to support, you know, and I was pursuing sport, you know, athletics, but to be honest, it was only paying me like six grand for six months. That's peanuts. Yeah. So then all the time and energy invested in athletics, I was like, man, I've got other priorities and I dropped it. You know, I dropped it because I had a child to take care of. And so I made the sacrifice. It's like, okay, athletics is going to go. Um, alcohol went, smoking out the window, no more stoners, no more, none of that was gone, you know. And, and then, you know, the idea of just seeing what matters most in life and thinking, wow, you know, I've been chasing after all these things, you know, the, the, the lifestyle of the rich and famous, mm. you know, trying to keep up with the Joneses. I don't even have to live like that, you know. Um, you know, I think of, you know, what Jesus says about, you know, life is more than food and the body is more than clothes, you know, that there's actually more to life than that. I had clothes. I didn't need new clothes. So if I have uh, stuff, I don't need a new TV. Uh, I don't need a new phone. Um, I don't need a flash house. You know, I'll find just an ordinary house that we can rent. And that's what we did. You know, we, we got a house for 240 a week rent. We were living upstairs. It was a three bedroom. But, you That's know, good, it, it had some stains at the <laughs> at the ranch slider, you know, from, from dog wee. But it was actually a decent place, you know. And that's what we could afford, so that's what we did. We had one car in the family, which we were gifted by my mom. And we were, we were eating healthy, but real simple, mm -hmm. like real simple. Uh, and I used to go and forage. You know, at the back of West Wave, there's these giant pear trees. Bro, I knew when they were in season. I was you there, there bro. I knew where grapes were on Summerland Drive. I knew where apples were. I knew where locals were. Like, it was like I took my kids with me, and it was like a fun thing. It wasn't like, oh, we're poor and we're scrummaging. It was like, hey, let's go and let's see what fruit we can find, you know. But it helped further the ends of the household, you know. Um, but but that's what we had to do. And, my, and at that time, my wife was not working. She was at home. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, and she was the one budgeting. She cooked and shopped within our means, and that's what we had to do, and so we just did that, yeah. So really, yeah, all you can do is live within your means, right? You know, like you said, people, you know, you want to live up to, you know, this lifestyle, mm. and, um, you know, it's all just for a little bit of, um, you know, acknowledgement from someone, you know, some sort of praise or yeah. someone to say, man, it's pretty cool what you've got, Yeah. or I like that, but it's only for a few minutes, you know, and then they walk, they go out about their day and they don't even remember what your, you know, what your car was Absolutely. or what you were wearing, you know, no one cares about that or even thinks about that, but yeah. you would get yourself into debt to live that lifestyle. Um, and, you know, it's interesting how, you, you know, you're talking about your conversion experience and this sort of changed, you know, things for you. And, you know, even Jesus said, you know, 
seek you know the kingdom of God first, first. and all these things shall be added unto mm -hmm. you know he talks about you know providing for the birds and and the flowers and says you know how much more important are humans human beings to, to him than yeah. those you know and he'll take care of the rest so I think you know for myself as a Christian even though these times are so tough and mm. and it's easy to get in caught up in it and you know worrying about what the prices are going up to next and yeah. petrol and all of that but at the end of the day you know I feel peace because I know that Jesus is ultimately in control of everything yeah and as humans, we're a lot more important than birds and flowers. And he still provides for them, so he promises that he'll provide for us. Totally. So there's actually no, there's no need to worry um, if you believe in Christ. Absolutely. Because he'll take care of all of your needs. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I can think back to times when, yeah, whatever it was we needed, you know. And, uh, and it's not like I was being lazy. I was working hard, mm. trying to provide. And if we didn't have, like, actually, we would kneel down as a family and say, okay, Lord, Please provide. We need a fridge. Mm. You know, we need a bed. One time, uh, our bed got mold. This is where we're staying now. Bed had mold at the end, and I knew mold is a no-no. So we gave up our bed. We were sleeping on the floor, and I remember just praying, like, Lord, please provide. You know, we really need a bed. One day, out of the blue, my landlord comes and she's like, Hey, guess what? I just saw. I just saw a bed at the op shop, and it's for four hundred and fifty dollars. You guys wouldn't happen to need a bed. I was like, Hey. <laughs> Who's been talking to you? <laughs> you? You know, but she didn't buy me the bed. Through the prayer, like my wife and I, after we prayed, my landlord gave the story. And then later on, checked my account. There was $450. It's like, <laughs> what? That's amazing. What man. just happened? And, you know, it, it sounds so far-fetched, like, you know, Alice in Wonderland fairy yeah, yeah. tale. But that's what happened, yeah. you know? And to me... Uh, God says, ask and I'll provide. Mm. You know, you've done your best. You petition God. And just to show that he cares, he provided a bed for us, you know. And we're not trying to keep up with the Joneses. We're like, we'll take whatever we can get. <laughs> and we got a bed, you know. We've got a fridge. And, and so many of the things we've had when we were in desperate need, whether it's food or whatever, we prayed, Lord, please help us. And he took care of us, mm. you know. Um, yeah, it seems like, you know, everyone's looking to the government to be able to, fix those problems, you know, and those mm. solutions. And even to the point of, you know, fixing our family thing. So yeah. is the government going to come give you a bed or something? Yeah, that's... You know? but, <laughs> but really... It, Where are you it, sleeping tonight? <laughs> Chris, Christopher Luxon or Chris Hipkins is going to come and say, man, you need a bed, don't Can you? Can I check what's in your fridge tonight? <laughs> you know, yeah. But yeah, everyone's looking to them. Um, and it's interesting because everyone thinks that, you know, God's a fairy tale or whatever you've heard yeah. about him. But... You know, we've had real experiences Absolutely. and, you know, you, just you sharing some of your true experiences that you've had, you've witnessed that. It's not, totally. it's not a joke. It's not totally. a fairy tale. It's something you've, you've experienced and, you know, you weren't looking to the government. Not at all. You're looking to God and it's like, that's the problem I think with society at the moment. We're so focused on what man can do Ab for us. Absolutely. When we have the opportunity to reach out to God, you know, Absolutely. Who, who is the one who really is in control of everything. Absolutely. Right? You know, and if we went to him more with the issues that we had, we wouldn't be complaining about, you know, what the government's going to do because Absolutely. he'll come through for you. Totally. You know? Yeah. And, you know, even if it's an inspiration, he gives you a new idea or he provides or mm. directs you to where you can make it, you know, whatever the avenue of his provision, it's still something that he will answer. You yeah. know, the way he answers is, I suppose, depending on your personal situation, mm. but he will answer. You know, I was even thinking what you quoted earlier about seek first the kingdom of God. And it's like, you know, there are so many other things in life because, you know, people are talking about taxing the rich. And, you know, I, I think to myself that, you know, there's a principle that makes that kind of true in one sense, but not in terms of the government taking money from the rich to give to the poor. But in terms of seeking the kingdom of God, you know, the Bible has the principles of, you know, those who have, if you have enough, then everything above your enough mm. can actually be used to make a difference for someone in need, you know. But when the government forces that on you, then you don't want to do it. Yeah, it's yeah. like, nah, when yeah. now you're forcing me. <laughs> I worked for this money. I don't want to do it. But, you know, when you see through God that actually we're one family, mm. one human family, and your struggle is my struggle, you know. The person who's down over there homeless, that that's he's as much a New Zealander as I am, you know, and we're one, one family, and I have that obligation as a fellow human being a child of God that God has provided for me and rather than saying oh now the government must provide or yeah. winds must provide I see a need right there and I walk past it so that I the government must go and fix it when I can actually 
make a difference right there. You know, there's the story of the Good Samaritan, you know, where, you know, people that see the need, they walk past. It's like, oh, someone else will sort it out. But if we as a human family, you know, did the, the Christian thing, it's not, oh, well, I suppose I'll call it the Christian thing because it's taught in Christianity, but I think it's the, the human thing to do. And, and just try and make a difference for our neighbor, mm. you know. It would lighten the load on the government, you know, because we actually know what's happening. You know, you know what's happening in my home. Yeah, I know yeah. what's happening there. And I can make a difference for you before you go to wins and before you go to the government, you know, because I know what the real struggle mm. is. But actually, very often, people's recommendation will be, oh, well, you should go line up at wins. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, when I know I can make a difference for you. And I think that's something that um, people can also take on to account that, you can't legislate it, but really that's fundamentally what the Bible tries to make, to do is, is make people more compassionate mm. to their fellow neighbor. Yeah, I think it, it goes back to our last video that when, you know, when we were talking about crime and we were trying to figure out, you know, what's the real issue behind why the crime rate is so high. And mm. it goes back to, you know, this sort of morality and, and how people actually perceive each other. You know, yeah. a lot of people don't have love for each other. Mm -hmm. you, know? you know, the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. And yeah. People aren't like that towards each other. Not at know? all. Everyone's trying to get their own. So you think about what a society would be like if people treated everyone like they, you know, that that was your brother or your sister or yeah. your mother or your father, you know, and you actually showed them love and compassion for everyone, you know, and it's everyone in today's society is like, take, 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 take you know, take, get as much absolutely. as I can for myself, store it up. And it's like, even if you don't need that, you know, imagine if everyone gave freely and fairly to everyone mm. to help everyone. All their they, excess, yeah. Yeah, the excess that they had to the people who didn't have. Yeah. You know, society would be in a completely different place and we wouldn't be in, in this situation right now where we're complaining about what is the government going to do? What is the government going to do? Absolutely. About, uh, you know, the, the, these prices and That's everything. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, because, you know, a lot of the situations are beyond even the government's control. And, you know, um, what you're just saying about, you know, loving your neighbor, I think you know, to a large degree, that's a load that can be carried uh, by the vast majority of humanity, you mm -hmm. know, because I think to myself, you know, in my pantry and in my home, I ask myself, how much food do we waste? Yeah. Like how much actually do we waste? Do we let go bad? How many times do we not want to eat leftovers? Um, and so they go from there to the bin when actually a lot of that excess could be repurposed for someone in need, mm. you know? Or if I did decide to eat the leftovers, there would be extra money to actually make a difference for others in need, you know? And, and I think everyone knows a family that's in need. And if they reached out, um, it would be a shared load, you know? And I think the government wouldn't be trying to fix, like, problems down the very bottom yeah. in, in, each people, in each individual's home, uh, and life would be different. You know, the story in the Book of Acts, you know, um, where it says that people shared what they had, mm, you know, mm. they saw each other's need and, and they thought, hey, I've got enough, I'll make a difference for you. Mm -hmm. I think that's what life would be like, answering your question, what would life would be, be like? <laughs> that's what it would be like, you know, and everyone would have enough, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, and we could be content with what we have. Mm. I don't have to compete with someone else. It's like, I have what I need. I think you covered it right there. <laughs> I don't know if you have any last thoughts or anything to add, but I think that that's the key, man. Yeah. Maybe a last thought is, you know, uh, a huge role of churches and charities, mm -hmm. you know, uh, is to, to take care of the vulnerable. You know, yeah. and I think that even though it might be a scary place to go, but I know that if people come to church and... Um, and ask for help and say, hey, could you guys help us with our needs? Many churches have food banks, and even those who don't would be more than happy to make a difference. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think City Missions is a Christian institution, but it's built into the institution to do that. And so people who are actually down and out should just take the opportunity. Despite all the science, all the facts that you've heard, it might just help you grab hold of God as really tangible. Yeah. Um, yeah. Nice. Sweet, bro. <laughs>